Hello, everyone, and welcome to the brand new show, The Wanderlust Show, which is presented by me, your host, Mimi Novik, and Nick Payne, a.k.a. Lord Chalkwell. Ah, oh, thank you so much for joining us today. This is our first episode, and we have an absolutely wonderful guest to kickstart the show. It's an absolute honour uh, and a pleasure to welcome the ever lovely Francoise Pascal. Now, Francoise is an actress, a producer, author, and radio presenter. She has had one of the most fascinating careers in showbiz, which has taken her from being in the centre of swinging London in the mid-60s to cult status as a model and actress in the 70s. She finally found solace as a humanitarian dedicated to helping the underprivileged and elderly. Francoise was educated in Paris and London. Her first taste of showbiz came when she was dancing on Top of the Pops in the 60s. And her first film was Loving Feeling, a film by Bashu Sen. And you know, this is amazing as well. She was one of the co-stars in There's a Girl in My Soup appearing with the legendary Peter Sellers, which I have to say is one of my favourites. Now, one day when she was having lunch with her then partner, Richard Johnson, at the White House, well, actually not even at the White House, at the White Elephant in Mayfair. <laughs> Maybe it was even at the White House, who knows? Um, Kirk Douglas spotted her and offered her the lead role in a film, but she turned it down to do a film with Jeanne Roland, and I hope I'm saying this correctly. One of her most famous roles also was playing Danielle in the cult com comedy series Mind Your Language, which was very, very well known, and um, I think it was one of the things that made Francoise exceptionally um, famous. Now, having experienced the highs of a glittering film, stage, and television career, as many of us, there were also the turbulent lows, which she will talk to us about, and this ranged from an unhappy and turbulent relationship to abortion, rape, affairs, drugs. And really, you know, so amazingly, she has survived it all and is here to tell her amazing story, incredible life story, and how she has turned all of that into helping those less privileged. And I am delighted and honoured to welcome dear Francoise. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was wow. quite incredible. <laughs> no, I know, it was incredible. I've, I've got what, my mouth open. <laughs> what an introduction, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Francoise, I, I have to say, ever since, you know, Nick, you know, said, we're going to have you on the show, I've been very excited and I want, you know, to definitely lay that red carpet out for you. Oh. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> wow, well, I don't know if I, I don't know if I deserve all that. <laughs> well, she's never laid the carpet out for me ever. <laughs> <laughs> but then I don't deserve it. Yeah, go on. <laughs> don't be jealous. Don't be jealous now. No, I can't remember, but yeah, carry on. No, You've had your time. You've had your time. Let yeah, me I'm, have I'm, mine, I'm, okay, I'm, Nick? I'm, yeah, I'm ab absolutely, darling. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now thank you again, Francoise. And You're welcome. I am, you know, I was looking through all the things that you have done and all the things that you do and for me, it's like having a legend here now. Oh, wow. um, you know, I'm really, really honoured, and I know Nick speaks so highly of you um, that oh. it, was, it, it isn't it, Nick. It was something that Ab had to be done. Absolutely. Well, as I said, you know, I, I was a young man, and and um, you know, as I say, watching Mind Your Language in the in the seventies, late seventies, you know, it was amazing for me to to um, actually get the opportunity to um, meet up with Francoise and she knows that. And as I said, and it's just been such a good journey as well. We got to know each other over the last five or six years. Amazing. And I never thought 
you know, we're looking back at that time that I'd ever meet Francoise. It was quite amazing to me. We, um, had, we, we had a good laugh on the, you know, along the way. Oh, yeah. along the way, that's right, exactly. No, we we did, we did. Um, as I said, and I'd sort of. So, where did first, you? How did you two meet? Um, well, I connected up with um, Francoise. I didn't know whether it was her because you get these idiots on Facebook that put celebrity faces <laughs> up and pretend, <laughs> pretend it's them, yeah. But um, but it just happened to be that Francoise was Francoise and. I said, are you the Francoise Pascal that was in Mind Your Light Language? And she said, yes, yes, yes. And we connected up and then... You was we, annoying me by that, by I was, then. Yeah, I was in, I was in, yeah, oh, really? Yeah, I was in, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think I've been stalking or something. Yeah, so then um, I um, we agreed to meet at uh, in Joe Allen's Francoise, wasn't it, in Covent Garden. That's and right, that's right. We, we, we met up and I was... I was running a bit late and Francoise was really, wasn't happy with me when I got there. So I had to go on full charm offensive. I'd, I'd had a few bit to drink as well, but um, we had a, anyway, we, we, we got into the meal and, and we got going chatting and we got on really, really well. And then I could, I, have said to, I could have said to him, how dare you make me wait? Do you know I, who well, I am? I think, I, think you, I think you did say that to me. I did not say I did not say that. I, no, you, you didn't. But no, we had a, we had a really nice evening, and then our friendship really sort of developed from there. And we, Francois said about the um, Heritage Foundation, which is they're the people that put the um, decide on the blue plaques for the people plaques for the people that have passed away, and you know mainly sort of well showbiz people or whatever in all different fields, but mainly mm -hmm. sort of show business. So the comedian, and, comedian and actors. Yeah, 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 yeah. That those those sorts of people, and and um, so Francois said about. Um, going on these lunches but I'd had so much to drink when she was telling me and I'd sort of almost forgotten about it and then I I got a phone call this I think we went out on a Friday night Francoise and then it was a Monday I got a That's call from right. got this guy called David Graham who looked like he'd been ironed David Graham he was so thin he looked like he'd been ironed and um and he he came on and sort of said oh I'm David Graham Da, 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 da. And I thought, oh, that's right. And I, then I remembered what Francoise had said. So I then sort of joined Francoise on these heritage lunches, which were really, really good because I love all that show business thing and, you know, the people that I'd seen, in the, you know, in the films and mm. people like Liz Fraser that's no longer with us and um, all these different different people that I'd, I'd seen. Nor on, is on, David. On... No, I know David. Nick David, David died. No, I heard. I heard that. You, you told me that. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know that until... Yeah, um, but there was all these different different people that, you know, I'd sort of got the opportunity to meet. Um, and then sort of there was a big lunch because Robin Gibb, or the late Robin Gibb from the Bee Gees, used to be the um, president of the Heritage Foundation. So his wife said, I think it was about two or three years ago, wasn't it? Um, Do you guys want right. to have, have a, the Heritage Lunch here? Which was in Oxfordshire. And that was a lovely day, Francois, wasn't it? In, in um, the Prevendor, his property, Robin That's Gibb's right. property. And that was a really, really good lunch there. So, yeah, I had some really good times doing that, which I wouldn't have obviously done if I'd not met up with Francoise. And, uh, yeah, it, and we've had we've had some good fun since, haven't we, darling? We've had some we good did, fun. We did, we did. And we've kept in touch, you know, all the time. We haven't, I mean, some people I know that keeps in touch with you and then afterwards they disappear. But Nick hasn't, you know, Nick has always been Nick. Oh, <laughs> so, yes. He's there. He's there. Like a <laughs> yeah, dog. You know, he's there. <laughs> no, it's, it, it's great. But as I said, but, yeah, no, 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 we've had, we've had, you know, it's been great knowing you. And as I said, and we've done some good things together and, and we were talking about, you know, we're going to meet up in the new year. And as I said, we was talking about Francoise is, is uh, working on this new film production at the moment, which is really exciting for her too. It's just been a pain like it has been for everybody with the COVID. And, um, you know, it's put a lot of people, you know, in a, in a very difficult Well, I've position. actually been working on this film for five years, um, producing it and trying, you know, and found the money and found everything together, put together. Um, but it's, it has been a long haul um, trying to get things, um, you know, going. Um, yeah. But this film is 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 one of of a project that I I am extremely proud of, extremely proud of because it's a yeah. fabulous thriller, and it's starring uh, Patrick Bergen, and mm -hmm. uh, and with uh, Ian Ogilvy, um, Sean Williamson. Uh, we have some fabulous actors um, on board. Mm. 
and and uh, my co-producer is uh, the late Donald Sinden's son, Mark Sinden. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. So we, we really have a fabulous, fabulous film that you know we will be looking forward to presenting to the public and presenting yeah. to everybody. Can you tell us a little bit about it, what the, the plot or anything, or is it pretty secret at the moment? I'm not sure. Well, at the moment, it's a little sort of like secretive. Um, we don't want to say too much about the plot. No, 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 I understand that. No, I just wanted to get um, any... But, any but it, is, it, it is a thriller, and it is a, a you know riveting thriller. That's all sure. I can say. <laughs> fantastic. fantastic. Yeah. And when are you hoping um, for that to come out, Francoise? About the end of next year. Okay. Okay, so which will be, which we will have um, ready for uh, a preview by the end of next year, and it'll come out by, by um, sort of like yeah, end, end of next year, beginning of the year after, of twenty two. Mm-hmm. Amazing. I mean, I want to go back actually yes. and <laughs> ask you a little bit about. Let's start somewhere. Tell us a little bit about where your incredible life started, because it is when you read about it, it is really the things that films are made about. In fact, um, <laughs> it, it's fascinating. Really, it is. Um, Thank you. It really, it, it, well, it's something beautiful that I would love you know for you to share with us with. Nick and myself and the listeners out there because there is so much more to you and you have a fascinating life. How did it all begin? It all began on, on an island um, where I was born. Um, mm-hmm. I was born on the island of Mauritius and uh, with French and Mauritian parents. Mm-hmm. And uh, it all began there with a dream that I had when I was a young girl. Um, you know, I remember acting in front of a mirror um, and thinking, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. Nothing else. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and um, and I was quite, you know, I mean, I, I just loved the films that I used to see when I was a little girl. And that those films were period films, um, like with Sissy, with Romy Schneider and... Uh, all the period films that um, you know you could say we were able to watch at, at a young age, mm. um, and the dream came from there, for, from you know seeing those films, and then when we came to England, um, we actually went to um, um, you know I mean I saw all the most beautiful people around me and I used to think oh I want to be like them I want to be like them Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't want to be a little girl from from an island you know I want to be among the bigger picture and which I did I actually found myself in the 60s um, you know, um, I found myself with Julie Christie uh, meeting the animals, Eric Burden of the animals, mm. and uh, going to their their record launch. And I don't know how the hell was I invited to those things. I really promise you, I've, I've, I've got no a pretty idea. good idea. <laughs> the way you look. <laughs> what? I said the way you look. You're very attractive, and and you know, it's, and, and you're very. Um, bubbly character and just, you know, one of these people that, you know, ma- magnet, yeah? It's, yeah. That's what, it, that's what it's about. Well, yeah, maybe. <laughs> but I was actually more or less, um, I had my eyes were on, 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 as I said, the bigger picture. And, and, and therefore I, you know, I became, I wanted to become an actress and I wanted to learn and which I did learn, I uh, went to, to, to school for that. And, uh, and I, I mean, not ordinary school, when I went to ordinary school, I did not learn much because I just hated it so much. You know, I was above all those things and I knew I was, I was clever, but I didn't think I was intelligent and I knew I wasn't that intelligent, mm. but uh, I, I had some kind of intelligence, you know, I mean, I was able to actually, uh, put things together, but really, um, you know, to to knowledge comes from what you do in life, you know, because that that is the the knowledge of of life, really. 
And uh, and I, you know, and I began my career by this first film that Bashu then did called Loving Feeling. And I actually lied to him about my age. I was at least 17 years old and my mother had to sign um, the, 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 the contract. And, uh, and when he went to my mother, he, he said, I thought she was 18 or 19. And my mother said, no, she's only 17, just turned 17. And mm. uh, she was really mad at me. <laughs> and, but what, what, why, what happened was that I actually, you know, was, um, had to appear uh, half nude. In those days, you weren't allowed to show the front, only just the back. And I, you know, I was really scared. Um, so they they gave me that little, you know, um, he gave me, the producer gave me uh, um, brandy to drink so that I could be at ease uh, to do it. Uh, but it, it was it was nothing really. I mean, when you think about it today, the way nudity goes, it was mm. it's much more today than it is than it was in those days. But at the same time, I, I received, I mean, the Daily Mirror um, took me from being in that film and, and exposed me completely as, you know, the, an actress, as the face to be seen in the future. And mm. the, Daily, the Daily Mirror actually gave me this, this incredible uh, start uh, in, in a career that I didn't even know I was going to have. Right. Then I went to France and I, you know, did few things. I mean, I went to college in France and I went to La Sorbonne and decided afterwards, after La Sorbonne, to leave La Sorbonne and come back to England. And I started making more films and I met Richard Johnson and I actually lived with him for 11 years. And whilst I was living with him, um, I had a lot of offers that was coming to me. Um, but he didn't want me to actually be a star because he was the star of the family and he really did not want me to be a star. He wanted me to actually be in the background all the time. And there was that kind of male chauvinistic uh, attitude in, in the 70s existed everywhere in England and even in France or in America or anywhere. But the chauvinistic attitude was rife, really bad. Um, so I was, you know, I stayed behind a lot of things. And every time I was offered something, um, somehow um, I, I wasn't able to do it because uh, I had, uh, he would he would actually sort of put me in the background. Um, when I remember when I did There's a Girl in My Soup and I actually... You, you know, at the premiere of There's a Girl in My Soup, behind me were the, the, the executives from Colombia. And then you had, you know, and then uh, next to me or behind me again was were the actors. Um, and Michael Caine was there with Shakira's wife. And uh, Sean Connery was there with his wife, Michelle. And, uh, you know, there was loads of people. And when I came on screen and people went, wow, you know, something like that. And and he, and everybody wanted to meet me. I mean, he didn't want anybody to meet me. So he took me at the back door so that, you know, we were, I remember because we were in, um, in, in near Water Street and he took me at the back door to go to a Chinese restaurant in Chinatown so that nobody would know me. Nobody would want to know me. Nobody would want to meet me. That's terrible. Um, so it was that. one of, yeah, I mean, it was a terrible thing. As I said, yeah. you know, it was very chauvinistic and it was really awful. But there you go. You 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 learn to to accept some of those things. Um, but at the same time, um, I you know, it was I was young. So I was able to actually, I mean, Columbia with Peter and Goldie. And I went to Hollywood to open the film of Peter and Goldie. And I was offered a, a year contract with uh, Columbia to actually do more films. But uh, somehow Richard got into it and, um, you know, I, everything just went. Everything. Do you, just think, do you think that, Francois, sorry, do you think that Richard... I had a word with the, um, you know, the powers to be, that sort of thing. To, to, I, I can't say because I do not know. I do not know. And if he did, um, God rest, God rest his uh, his soul. I'd kill him. 
Yeah. <laughs> if he was still alive, I still would kill him because I think he, he you know, he, I grew up with that man because I was very young when I met him and I grew up with that man. And when yeah. you grow up with somebody that actually molds you, uh, you accept a lot of things and uh, your youth is gone and you're, you know, and you, you suddenly bring out, um, you, you suddenly realize how, uh, perverse the whole thing uh, is uh, because uh, it, it was like being uh, kidnapped. Mm. If mm. you know, you know what I mean? It was like being kidnapped. It was like being uh, put into a little a, a cupboard. And when it's, uh, when it, f- it feels like for him to open it and show me out, it will do it. It'll do it. So yeah. it's, it was really perverse in a lot of ways. Mm. Um, but my career actually, you know, um, started when I was doing, well, Kirk Douglas, when he saw me and he said, I'd never forget this, is <laughs> um, the, the, the ultimate compliment I've ever had from someone who said, who came to me and said, "My well, it was actually her, his wife came over and came over and said, my husband thinks you're the most beautiful woman he has ever seen. Oh, <laughs> uh, that is coming from Kirk Douglas and his mm. wife. And I go, what? Yeah, <laughs> it amazing, was unbelievable. Yeah. It was just unbelievable. The ultimate compliment oh, yeah. a girl could ever have, you know. Mm. And when I was offered the film with, with uh, Kirk, unfortunately, I... I'd already signed a contract uh, in France, so I couldn't really have done um, Kirk's film. But um, the ultimate role that came to me was the 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 the, the, um, the Iron Rose, La Rose de Fer, as we say in French, um, because that was a, a film that I researched madness. Um, I don't know if you, Nick, you might know this. Um, Mm-hmm. You know, some people have a certain, you know, they, they, their mind just goes away from themselves and yeah. they see a lot of things and they, 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 don't, they, be, they become a little, in, in, there's a certain madness that goes into their head, into their yeah. brain. Yeah. And, um, you know, you sort of, you lose yourself completely, which I did in the, on the film. I did because I really, really loved doing that film um, because it was my film. It was something yeah. that I did it and mm. nobody else, you know, I mean, I taught myself so much doing that film. I taught myself, I taught myself real acting, you know, I, to, to, I mean, this is something that no drama school can teach you you can only teach yourself because mm. if you make so much, if you go out there and you, uh, and you, um, you are among people who, um, you know, who are in, in those institutions um, and, and you learn from these people and you, you, I, you know, you, you actually look at them and you go, my gosh, you know, I hope I'll never be like that in my lifetime. But it taught me an enormous lesson um, that you know, whatever happens in your life, um, you you can't you can't let it get to you. You have to actually go on and and get on with life. Yeah, it's important that that you know you you do that. Uh, but I've I must say you know, and then afterwards I had such an incredible amount of wonderful work that came to me, which I was very grateful for. Um, and and then uh, Mimi, you were Mimi, you were actually talking about the bad things that happened to me. Yes, later. yeah. Um, and those those happened when I, you know, I actually um, got pregnant, um, and uh, I w- I fell out of a uh, of a house and on fire um, on the oh third goodness. floor from the third floor to the railings. And um, my neck was between the railings and my arm went through the railings and I actually oh was pregnant goodness. at the time. 
Um, so I had to have an abortion. Well, I didn't have to have an abortion, but Richard made me have an abortion because um, he thought that the child would have been, you know, sort of not right. Although the doctors said it was right, but he wasn't really uh, pretty sure about that. So I had to have an abortion then. Um, but I was pretty. It was it was pretty traumatic um, because I my I would have had a little girl. Um, and that was really, that was really very, very traumatic for me. Um, but at the time also, I, what was more traumatic was that I nearly lost my life. I, I don't know. know. I don't know what happened, who saved me, whether there was a guardian angel saving me or whether it was my father saving me. I have no idea. But let me tell you, between in the house and the railings was a basement and you would I would have either gone straight to the basement and splashed with my brains out mm. or gone through the railings um, with my whole body going through the railings but you survived somehow it. I came out with my arm between you know, my neck between the railings and my arm on the railing oh, amazing um, amazing amazing it's a, it's a miracle Exactly. Uh, to totally, totally. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother always said that I had nine lives. <laughs> I, think I, I've actually, I've, no, I think I went through six. I got three more left. <laughs> it's incredible. I mean, I want to ask you also, um, Francoise, about... Mm -hmm. Now, Richard, he, in his own right, was a well-known, wasn't he, actor he was, at the time? He was a, an incredible actor. He was a mm. superb actor. You know, I mean, he was a Shakespearean actor as much as was a great a theatre actor uh, and a film actor. He was very famous and he was absolutely brilliant as an actor. I watched him work and it, I was in full admiration for that man because his acting was something Unbelievable, unbelievable. Um, he filled the stage when he was on, you know. He mm. filled the cinema when he was yeah, on. Yeah, very big presence, wasn't it? Very impressive. And why didn't he ever become a big star? I have no idea. Um, I think there was a lot of mistakes he made um, by marrying Kim Novak for a start. Uh um, and, um, you know, by refusing James Bond, you know, he was the first, he, he was offered James Bond and he refused it. So, oh, okay. It could, it could have been unbelievable in those days, but he didn't. The, the things that happen in our life, isn't it, Francoise? Yeah. It's the roads we take and roads we, that we don't take lead us to destinations. I don't know if it's destiny. I really don't. And I don't know either, but I think you're right. Yeah, it does lead us to a certain, um, you know, way of life that uh, that we don't we don't command you. We don't know about, and it's a mystery. Oh, excuse me, it's a mystery, and it's um, very very difficult to actually um, fathom the whole thing um, because there's a lot of my. Um, my path in life, I could have taken so much, so many paths, and I didn't take it. I saw just in, I saw um, Richard recently. It was because I recalled I used to love Tales of the Unexpected. I don't know whether you remember that, Mimi, but um, Francois, you remember I heard Tales? Of it. I, heard I do it. know. Yes, I do know. Tales, Tales of the Unexpected. Yeah, it was. It was Roald Dahl. He used to write these these little little stories, and they were really yeah. good. And they had a twist to the end of them, and. Um, so I, I saw him, I, I sort of recalled you one recently and Richard was in a one with um, Nigel Havers and it was... Uh, yes, it was, that's it was, right. I, well, I, I was around when he, he did that actually because uh, I, I was doing a play in the Peterborough and uh, it was called uh, Bell, Book and Candle. And right. Bell, Book and Candle, if you remember, the film is with uh, Kim Novak and, uh, um, oh. and James Stewart. Yeah. Yeah. And I was I was playing the lead. I was playing Gillian, um, the, the the role that Kim Novak had. So right. he came to see me. Richard came to see me to play to, to do the, when I was doing the play. We had broken up anyway at that time. Right. And he came to see me, and I thought, oh my God, this is the ex-wife that did it, and now me, the ex-girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's too much. But he really enjoyed my performance, which which actually spoke volume about you know That's i was very proud of it very proud yeah. that he was there and, and said you know how how good i was in it so That's brilliant. Yeah, it was nice 
It was nice, yeah. And and I, I visited the the set um, of the Tales of the Expected with him and and because um, they were actually doing it in Northamptonshire. Was it? It was yeah. It was like they were crossing over some sort of. It was some. It was they were they were. It was in the Egypt. I think it was. That's was right. Well, it was actually Northampton. That they were. <laughs> yeah, I was in Northampton. It was. It was. A good, but, but that, but I tell. I tell you, ladies, in the in the seventies, I yeah. used to go to parties because I was quite you know you know sort of late teens and all that. And my um, my party piece used to be the dance at the start of the Tales of the Unexpected. It was a woman. It was like a naked woman, but you couldn't see she was naked. But, you you know, you could see it like a sort of James Bond type woman dancing, mm. cavorting around. And that used to be my party piece at any parties that I used to go to, the Tales <laughs> of the Unexpected dance, you know, with a, with a, fi- <laughs> with a fire behind me, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so, but, Come but, on, Nick, you're still doing that now, aren't you? Tell do you know what? Exactly. Right? Do you know what? The only reason I don't do it anymore is that nobody's old enough, older than me now, no knows what I'm doing, but um, <laughs> but, it, it, but it used to used to be used to be amused me anyway when I used to do it, and I didn't really care about it. everybody else was amused by it, but I used to get amused by it. I used to do it myself. But um, <laughs> look, don't let it put you off. You can perform that still when you no, go to you a party. I, I, no, but it was, I used to I used to love it. It was one of the one of the shows in the in the seventies, well, seventies, and I think it went into the early eighties as well. But mm-hmm. It was one of the, one of the other shows that I used to <laughs> used to love. But um, and I, but, I, but just getting on to what we were saying about Peter Sellers, I always say to Francois when I meet, I always say, "What was Peter Sellers like?" Because he was that was the... my question. That was going to be my next question. What was Peter Sellers like, Francois? He was wonderful. I absolutely adored that man. He was. Uh, I know people thought he was one of those uh, one of those actors that was sport and and um, crazy, mad, or whatever. Uh, it was difficult to to deal with, but he was difficult with producers and directors because he he was so much of a, a, a genius of what he did as a comedian and uh, as an actor that mm. I, you know he didn't want to always prove himself all the time because he wanted them to to realize how good he was um, right. and how wonderful he was really that's all he wanted is to be um, a, to have a pat on his back you know and say you're fabulous peter you're great peter and it's one of those about you know it's, it's the old hollywood kind of of, of um uh idiosyncrasies of you know you you have to be treated like like, like a child most of the time um, with these, uh, you know, with the studio actors. And uh, although Peter did start in England, the studios uh, in, at Ealing, but but he always had that that sort of group around him who would, mm. who would be always, you know, sort of like, yes, sir, no, sir, free bags full, sir. He didn't yeah. like that very much. He, didn't, he really didn't. But he wanted to let them know that he was actually a, a, a very good actor. But he had, he was a womanizer. <laughs> No, <laughs> he had his eyes on on it's so many up. women. It was unbelievable. Um, and when I when I actually worked with him, he, he didn't turn up on the set for about ten days later um, no. because he was out there somewhere with somebody, you know. Well, and he, he was, was about to be married to somebody else when we did Girl in My Soup, hmm. and uh, he was uh, in he was somewhere in Rome or with another woman. Um, <laughs> well, he was, wasn't he? Wasn't he with Sophia Loren? He was with. He, he was. He had an affair with. Yeah, that was that true. Yes, and, that was true. That was years ago. Years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and also, and also, he was really good friends with Princess Margaret as well, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Because he, well, he was it, he a bit did, of a social climber anyway. Yeah. Did you see that film that he did? That he did with. He did, they did like a, it was like a, a cine movie film. With Princess Margaret, and, and and it was it was really funny, and it was like in the mid-sixties. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. the queen, the yeah. queen must have been horrified by it. But, <laughs> um, but um, no, and and um, obviously, in piece of playing um, Inspector Clouseau in the Pink Panther films, which was just unbelievable. Um, the Pink Panther films were just my favourite, and yeah. a lot of people's favourite. The at thing, that time. the thing is that, yeah, yeah. Let let me finish with what what you know about Sorry. the film that I did with him. Um, yeah, the, the girl in my soup was was wonderful. Um, when the first time I ever met him, and um, he, as I said, he came about ten days later, and I, I loved it because I was getting paid, <laughs> um, and absolutely loved it. But uh, then then um, I was chosen to play with among 
um, the girls, the lay girls, um, uh, in a film called Soft Beds and Hard Battles. And in Soft Beds and Hard Battles, we, uh, Jenny Henley was with me and uh, Rula Lenska and all that. And uh, we, you know, and he actually came a month later. Um, we were supposed to be on the set on the first day, uh, but it never turned up. So we waited a month for him to turn up. And when he turned up, he turned up with Liza Minnelli. <laughs> he was with her. As you show. do. <laughs> As you do. So yeah. when, she goes, when she arrives on the set and, you know, with Peter, they gave her a seat. And whilst we were always on the set at four o'clock in the morning, never had a bloody seat. Really? <laughs> Tight devils. Have a chair. <laughs> Liza with a Z. Yeah, Liza with a Z. We were so mad. All of us became, we went, how dare they? How dare they? We've been working so hard here and no one gave us a seat. We had to sit on the props. <laughs> did, it, did, did, did Pete have an affair with her as well? I, I I couldn't tell you. I wasn't in their bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. So I, I'm not going to speculate on something I don't know. No, that's fair enough. <laughs> yeah, but he would he would he would definitely be one of my if I had a if I had a, a dinner thing, you know, of people that have passed away, sort of that I, it would be it would be Peter Sellers, John Lennon, Freddie Mercury. I'm just trying to think who else would have, but um all yeah. the mad people. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he, yeah, he was he was one he was one of the one of the ones that I would definitely um definitely have on my list. He was he was quite amazing. It must have been fantastic to to work with him, you know. It was um, lovely working with him. And he was he was actually um, what I, I I loved about him is that he would switch from one character to another. Yeah, yeah. Um in early, in in uh, uh, Soft Beds and Hard Battles, he was actually he played uh five or six parts, I think, or something like that. Mm. Um, he was a genius. I learned it's, it's, a lot. Sort of like a, yeah. He was a genius. He yeah. taught me a lot about comedy, and he taught me, you know, how to, you know, he, he was the first person to teach me about comedy uh, mm. in films, um, which I was very grateful to him. Um, the second person who taught me comedy in on television is um, Terry Scott, when I oh, did yeah. Happy Ever After with him. Yeah. Uh, so he was the second one who taught me comedy on television. Yeah, well, because I used to watch obviously another program. I used to watch um, was Terry and June, obviously, and the sort of seventies yeah. and eighties thing. And yeah, but, and but, yeah, but Terry and June, they started uh, the series called um, uh, Happy Ever After. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I remember that. And you was in yeah, that, wasn't that was, yeah. That's how they started the series, and I was in Happy Ever After. Yeah. Amazing. When you look back now, Francoise, at yeah. this somewhat charmed life, I suppose, and as all of us in this life, we have the highs and the lows. Yeah. How, you know, reading about the things that you've gone through, how have you managed to keep so positive and so vibrant? Because I can, you know... You have been through a lot in life. I think I, I think being positive is. Um, I had a beautiful son, who I absolutely adore, and I have. Um, I've. I'm lucky, and I thank God of the things that I've that of my life for my life because I didn't. Um, I never went homeless. Um, I've always had a roof over my head. Um, I never went without a man. <laughs> Is that one? Oh, God. No, I have never been without a man. <laughs> I've always had one around. <laughs> I never was without one. Oh, I wish I wasn't, honestly. Um, uh, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I've always had a man oh, around dear. telling me what to do. And, uh, I've, um, as I said, I've always had food on my table and I've always, um, even today, you know, being on my own, I, I really, I have a roof over my head, although it hasn't been an easy life. It really hasn't. I mean, you might think that I've, 
I've had an easy life with all this wonderful thing has happened to me mm. and all these things that no, it hasn't been an easy life because I've had to struggle and I'm still mm. as I'm, I am still struggling at getting you know things together and at, at putting my production together to you know living and things like that and uh living on a, a, a on you know basically on a um on a pension you know um and every time you try to actually do something and you know you, you want to to get things organized and done and something always comes in and comes around and pulls you away from it yeah. um it's 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 it, it hasn't been easy but as you say why do i keep positive mm. because i have two beautiful grandchildren and I love them to bits. And I know that I do everything that I'm doing today is for them. And, um, you know, so that they can have a proper life. You know, they don't struggle. I don't want them to struggle. I don't want them to go through life, you know, sort of thinking, when, when is my next meal coming from? Yeah. Um, I want them to actually have everything they want. Um, but at the same time, they have to learn. There's a lot of things they have to learn. And I think my son is very good with them. And my son and his wife would always teach them how to be able to, you know, um, uh, how to to get things that they want through, through themselves and not depending on anybody or anything. Um, and uh, th th they keep me positive, very positive about life. And uh, and I I have hope. I have a lot of hope. Um, and I also pray, you know, I pray all the time and um, I do my rosary every day. So therefore that keeps me positive. So many things keeps me positive. When I think of the life that I've had, I am grateful of that life because it taught me a lot That's and fantastic. I'm still going. Mm, it's funny, isn't it? I was saying about grandchildren. I've got, what are your grandchildren's names, Francois? Sorry? Your, what, your grandchildren, what, what are their names, your grandchildren's names? Oh, Alfie and Ruby. Alfie and Ruby, yeah, because I'm, I'm just saying because... Yeah, and Ruby, maybe, Ruby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, because grandchildren, I, I've got In grandchildren. seven and nine. Yeah. They're just they're fantastic, aren't they? I've got two grandchildren too. And I never, when I was, <clears throat> I don't know about you, when, when I, I would think the same, when I was younger and I had my, my girls, I never really was there very much because I was always working. But when my grandchildren came along, um, it, they're quite amazing, really, because you just, I sort of, you know, was with them quite a lot more. And yeah. I, I, and I know, you know, you know, Francois, the feeling you get with grandchildren, it's a feeling that you, you don't experience any other time. It's quite amazing, really. So I know exactly what you mean, you know? Yeah. It's lovely, but also the, the other thing that keeps me positive also is to help other people. Um, you know, I, I always try to help wherever I am. I always try to help the homeless by giving them um, food, by giving them um, clothes when they need it. Um, mm. and I know a little girl that I've looked after, a girl that I've looked after quite a bit um, all the time, giving her money for her, her host hostel um, and uh, giving her my a coat that I didn't need because it was it, it's so cold out there mm. and and gloves and uh, you know and food whenever she needs it or whatever but you know I mean I see them all the time at the station and it really breaks my heart that yeah. I can't do more than that you know um and I, I and it makes me feel good to to be able to help people and I like helping them and I like helping the elderly also to make make sure that they are all right. And if they need to cross a road or need to do anything, shopping or whatever, if I can do that for them, I will do it for them. Mm. Um, so it's it's it gives you an incredible satisfaction in life. And you you do keep positive about your life when you help others because mm. you feel that you are fortunate enough to have you know to have what you have even yeah. if little if, even if you have little um you know it's all right you know you're okay you're okay um you go home you are you have a roof uh, under your uh, uh, on top of your head when you go home mm. um but these people can't go home because they have no roof they have nothing 
Um, you know, they might have, through circumstances, they've lost everything. Um, and it could have happened to me also, you know. So how grateful can you get for your life? Yeah, well, and the three and the three of us, I know, I know we sort of believe in karma as well. And, you know, you do good things. And good things do come back to you. And, and you get a good sense of, you know, Yeah, but well-being. you shouldn't be doing things to get back to you, you know, for things to get back to you. You should be doing things. No, no, but you know what? You know, no, I, I know no, what I, you I, mean. I, I know what I you're trying to say. Saying. I think yeah. I think when I said about going back to you, I think what I mean, what I, what I do mean is that you, it makes you feel good. It makes you feel, it yeah. gives you a lot of pleasure. And makes gives you, you satisfaction good. that you've done something good for somebody. Exactly, exactly right. And that's that's what it's, you know, I think that's what life's about. And if yeah. more people did that, you know, wouldn't life be so much better, you know? Um, yeah. Unfortunately, not everybody's like it. And this pandemic has really really heightened all of that situation oh it has it has actually it makes you realize the things that you you have you know that makes you realize um uh, enormously i mean before you used to pass them and so okay fine give them some money and that's it you know because then you know they're going to be fine or whatever but now you you think twice about it you actually yeah. you might give them some money but talk to them you know, because you actually, you know, they, they can be very depressed also. So, you know, depression is one of the worst thing that you could ever, that anyone can ever have in their lives. And, yeah. um, but you have to talk to people. So whenever I do something and give something to, to a homeless person or, or to whoever, you know, I always have to stay and talk to them so that they have a certain amount of, of, um, of hope in their life because without hope there's you know you're nothing you're nobody no that's exactly uh, right that's the truth isn't it it's, yeah. it's a case of i think especially in these times but always through humanity i don't know about you nick and francoise but i always find that if we have been you know like each of us can go through turbulent times in our life it somehow gives us an understanding, a deeper understanding about compassion yep. towards other people. And in a way, it's people usually who have gone through the greatest tragedies in life that are able to comfort those in times such as these. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Totally, uh, I agree, totally agree. And well, it's it's, it's one of those things that people have... Um, you know, th that some people don't understand that. When when I look at Facebook and um, I look at people that indulge themselves so much about something that they've done or something that they've, um, you know, or they have cancer or things like that, and they have to always ask for, uh, for uh, acceptance, always ask for being, um, you know, for feeling sorry for them. For them. Um, I, yeah, sure, I feel sorry for people who has any kind of diseases or whatever, but I can't, you know, but why do you uh, always have to say, I am, you know, I have this or I have that on, on social media? And if you look around you, you'll see the amount of people that are suffering um. in silence, you know, and, and not able to talk about it because they, they're they either afraid to talk about it or they don't want to talk about it. And these are the people that you need to help because these are the people that, you know, can go into depression. And that depression is the most, is a horrible, horrible thing to happen. And it happened to me many times, you know, being depressed and, and wanting to actually take my own life, you know, because of the depression that I've been through. I went through, um, but you have to really, you know, think about the people that cannot talk about it and, and won't talk about it. And they go through that depression, they can kill themselves or they can do something drastic to themselves. So these are the people that needs to be helped. You yeah. know, not the one bragging about things on Facebook that, that mm. gets to me so much, you know, do you think it's also maybe the sign of the times, Francoise? Where, yes, it is. Yes, it is, I'm afraid. You know, where so. maybe, yeah, it's like there are tragic things out there and there are really terrible things that happen. And I think we've all experienced that somewhat in our lives, some more than others. But 
social media, although it has its good points, it's become, I think a lot of it is that there is a tendency that it becomes a little bit, as you know, the old saying goes, the me show, where mm. people become self-obsessed. And I found that a lot, is that it's all about them. Yes. And it's that's when people, isn't it? It's yeah. sort of people then, when it becomes all about you, not, mm -hmm. you know, per se, like if we become so self-obsessed that it's all about us, we are going to be miserable and that's sad. That's right. That's exactly and upset correct. Because it's a spiral and it's a well that never, it's never filled. Yeah. Because you can never have too much attention and you know more about that, you know, being in the limelight for such a yeah. long time. Yeah. Where does it stop? in fact where does reality sort of sink in and the, the lines are often blurred aren't they yes they are but the reality will sink in when you actually realize that um you know as you grow older you mm. realize how your life has been in in such a way that you know you, you, they, there's there's a, a, a certain way that you recognize um the truth about yourself and there's, mm. there's an age when you come to, I mean, I suddenly realized who I was when I was 60 years old. Uh, I'm 71 now. And uh, at 60 years old, I, I, I realized that I, you know, that life wasn't what it, you know, what it was when we were young. And what mm. happens is that you have an incredible, when I was in, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, I was known. Things were, no, but 70s, 80s. And when, the reality hit me when things had changed was in the 90s and, and right. 2000s because um, in because nobody saw me on television. So people were like, you know, who are you? Well, you know, things like that. So you suddenly, you know, at first it hurt. It hurt really badly. Then afterwards I thought, yeah, well, you know, I can see why they're doing that. It's because I'm not on television and I have to, and this is reality now. Reality sinks in now, you know, so you've got to do something else um, because you've got to survive. And to survive, you've got to pay your bills and you've got to do this, you've got to do that. So I survived. I survived by being uh, um, an executive uh, assistant to uh, to directors of uh, companies or um and by you know, and really being, being proactive, and and that's survival, and that's also um, you know, reality was sinking into into you all the time. And when you were, when I was working in ordinary places like charities and things like that, um, mm. you know, people used to come out, aren't you, aren't you? I know who you are. I know. I said, yeah, 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 okay, no, no, you know, I didn't want to know. I did not want to know who I was. Um, I, I was who I am today, you know, and this is my name. This is who I am. I'm doing something and I am actually um, working for a living. So let me be, let me work for my living. Let me be. I do not want to, I don't want you to come over and say, oh, I know who you are. I know what you've been doing. I know you, are, you were wonderful. No, please go away. And this is how I was. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, it, it's, it, just came, it slapped me in the face by saying, hey, you've got to accept it the way, you know, because people are actually going to do that all the time and yeah. you're going to have to accept it. If you don't accept it, then, you know, it, you're stupid because mm. then you have to accept it, you know, what comes to you. Um, so reality did come in very quickly, you know, in the, in the, uh, in the 90s and in well, in the millennium, you know, started also. Mm. So now I'm accepting the whole thing because I love the fact that I have actually reinvented myself again in this business. That's you brilliant. Know? That's you know, brilliant. That is brilliant, isn't it? It's like, um, in a way, a phoenix from the ashes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm not yet the phoenix. <laughs> but I always think of that. You know, yes, but you know, I always think of that because I think, I don't know about you two, but I think to myself, we are all somehow, we have this element of a phoenix because we are all in every moment somehow reinventing ourselves because we're changing. 
we, we're yeah. in a constant motion of change. So the old, you know, yesterday has gone. You know, we can never go back to that. Tomorrow, we hope for tomorrow, but really the only time that we have is right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. No, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that's um, a sobering thought, that in reality, the only time that we have in our hands is this present moment. Yeah, exactly. But I, I, think, I think this year as well, I mean, I'm, I'm really looking forward to so progressing on, uh, you know, like Francoise, I've got I've got some new sort of projects on. We both got some new projects on. We all have, and yeah, and it's, um, life, life is is for living, and it's about being well, optimistic. You, yeah, you, know? well, you have to reinvent yourself all the time, mm. and, yeah. you know, and and make sure that whatever invention you have about yourself, you you bring out the best of yourself, and you have as much hope, um, yeah. you know, in your life um, and faith. Uh, about yeah. yourself, which is very yeah. important, which is very, well, this, very important. You know, this is what our show was about, really. It's about, you know, the hope for the future, our hopes and mm. what we want what we want to do. And as I said, there's so much negativity around at the moment. And oh. but, there's, but, there's, but there's a lot of hope. I always sort of say, like, when, when the first lockdown came, um, you know, being 60 this year myself, and, and if I'd have been born 60 years before, I would have been in the First World War and probably died as a result of it in a trench, you know, with somewhere. So I, I'm grateful, really, this year, even when people were moaning about it, I thought, well, when we first got locked down and we just thought that we had to sort of stay indoors and watch TV or whatever, I thought, well, this is all right because, you know, I'm safe and, and all the rest of it, not like the poor devils, you know, that went through the really bad times. I think we've lived generally through really good times and it just so happens this year it's been a, you know, it's been, it has been tragic for a lot well, of I think it's opened, it's opened a lot of people's eyes this year. Um, oh, yeah. You know, for yeah, what yeah. has been happening, that you know, you can't always have everything. No. Um, you you you've got to you've got to actually um, you know pay for something. Yeah. Uh, I, made, I think it's made us all. Sorry, Francois. I think it's all made us. You know, a lot of us realise that you know, as you say, it's not. You shouldn't take things for granted, and the simple things yeah. like your family and your friends, and making time for people. You that's know? right. That's right. That's, and talk to people, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, wh wherever you meet, um, you know, whether homeless or whether whatever, you know, talk to them, talk to them and, and make sure that they're okay. Yeah, um, don't, You know, don't leave them there and so, you know, just give them money or whatever it is, but always talk to whoever it is, you know, whoever you meet in your life, you talk to people, talk to them and, and find out who they are, find out, because we only have one life, really. Yeah. Um, and like me, I'm at Elstree Studio today, and tomorrow I might not be there at all. Um, like the guy who was the, one of the guards uh, um, in, in the at Elstree um, yeah. was there two days ago, and then he he had a, a cardiac arrest and died. Oh, oh you know. Oh, yeah. um, so life is life is very short. Um, when you look at it, and and you only have one life, you so do the best you can out of it. Unless you're James Bond and then you only live twice. I thought I'd get that one. <laughs> I doubt that. <laughs> Even James yeah. Bond only lives once. <laughs> I would just say, he did, yeah, he did, he did he, yeah. And because we've lost, because we've, we've lost Sean, we've lost Sean Connery and, and, and Roger, Roger, Roger Moore before that. So, yeah, exactly. He's trying to get himself out of it, Francoise, now. Yeah, do you know, do you know yeah, what? I've, I've, I've given up. I've given up trying to get out of things. Just, uh, you just right. want to be James Bond, don't you, Nick? Oh, do you know what? I'm more like Brooke Bond, unfortunately. But, um, that's another story. Or, ba or Basil and Bond, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, Francoise, what's your, what are your hopes for the other than the film, what are your hopes for the sort of going forward, your for the future and and you know from from now, uh, what, what, what's Francois going to going to be sort of hoping for in the next sort of coming years? Well, <laughs> I'm I'm one day at a time, Nick. One day at a right. time. <laughs> okay, that's a good answer. That's, good, that's answer. good advice, actually. Yeah, well, one day at a time. Unfortunately, mm. it has had too many. Um, you know, I've, I've got this film has really put so much on me, and it's, it's got to be. I'm thinking more of it all the time, and it's, making uh, sure that it, it happens. Yeah, are you filming other than Elstree? Are you on any locations at all? 
Will it, will um, it, will we it, are going to actually be. Uh, we are going to be a location for. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, we will be uh, in Mauritius. Uh, we're location in Mauritius and London. That's right. Oh, okay, okay. So that's 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 cool. So you'll be. When was the last time you went back to Mauritius again? Oh God. Oh, about three years ago, three, four oh, okay. years ago. When I there, okay. wasn't it? Didn't I? Yeah, I think I, think I, so. I, I remember. I was you out went, there I, because they've asked me, they asked me to open a school, uh, an acting school. That's out it. There. Yeah, I remember you said you'd gone. I couldn't think when it was. That's yeah, right. I, I heard about three or four years ago. Um, I didn't like it then. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to like it again. <laughs> right. Okay. It's too hot out there. It's, it's horrible. Is it? Yeah. Is it very humid? It's, it, it, it's humid now, um, uh -huh. sort of like December, January, um, February. It's, it's humid and horrible. And that's when they have cyclones and things like that. Um, comes March, they, it, it gets cold, uh, not cold. I mean, their weather is like, uh, their cold weather is like our summer. <laughs> All right. When, when oh. you went back, when you went back, did you visit your, your family home? Did I what? Did you did you go because your family home when you were when you were like when you were born in Mauritius, wasn't you? So you, I was you, born there, yeah, and I left yeah, when so, I was twelve. Yeah. So did you did you go back? You was you know in your book you talked about your your, your the lovely home that you had and the seven bedroom place and it, it yeah. sounded wonderful. Did you did yeah. you go did you you know go back and re, you know re, revisit the place or did you go? I did. Did you, I did. I went and and revisited it and. Uh, I'm afraid it was taken over, um, and um, um, about 17 families work <laughs> lives there. Really, really. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid so. Um, Francois, you know, tell us yeah. about your book. Sorry, tell us about your book. Where is it available, and what's it called? Well, it's not. I'm afraid it's been oh. uh, continued because I will have. You know, I'm looking for another publisher at the moment so that I can re-publish uh, my book and mm. redo it. So, um, if there's any publisher listening, um, there you go. <laughs> Get in touch with me. Um, well, we can have but, a little chat afterwards. I might point you somewhere. Okay. Okay. Yes, yes. But we'll it needs to be after. redone. Yeah. And I had mm -hmm. a very bad publisher, very, very bad publisher. Um, and I'm, I wasn't happy with them at all. And uh, the book did quite well, but they did not market the book at all. And, uh, you know, when you have a book that's out, you have to market it. You have to actually get a lot of the, um, a lot of publicity through it. And they did not nurture that so um you know so it didn't do as well as it should have done but um i'm looking yeah for it's anyone. important it's not just about writing it people need to know it's there exactly, exactly. it's very yeah, important you know i mean like my friend yeah it's like my friend leslie ann jones you know she's written so many books um about bowie and things like that and only about Lennon. And now that she's having such a, a, a great publicity thing, it's because she's got a very, very good, um, you know, publisher. Makes all the difference, that's for sure. Hello? Oh, when well, you'll have to, I hope that... It makes an enormous amount. Yeah. Yeah. I hope you're going to bring it out yeah, again and, and then republish it. Yeah. I would like to do it, you know, ASAP, actually. Yeah, that would be very interesting reading. Is it uh, an autobiography? I have to read. Uh, there's a lot of things I have to add in and and put in and things like that. Yeah. Uh, and that, that would be quite good. But, you know, but at the same time, you know, you've got to have a good publisher that will believe in you um, and, and believe in the book. And that is a big problem that we have th th these days. Um, if you... You're, you know, I mean, I haven't been on television. Oh, by the way, I am going to be on television on the 21st. Oh, really? What are you yes, doing? It's, it's uh, called, um, what is it, on the 21st? It's uh, um, When Comedy Goes Wrong. Right, okay. When, on when, Channel 5 at right. 10 o'clock. On the 21st? On the 21st, on Monday. Oh, would oh. you? Oh, that's 
I'll, I'll, because I'm, yeah, I'm driving, I'm driving, well, I'm, oh no, I better not say what I was going to do, but uh, I'm, I'll be driving it somewhere. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll text it to you. I'll text it to <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, me, me, yeah message, message me, darling. Message me, I better keep my mouth shut. <laughs> uh, be quiet, be quiet, Nick. Don't say yeah, anything. You, no, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to be very, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to be sitting in my, in my armchair for the next 10, 10 years doing nothing. Yes, exactly. Until, until exactly. we, until we, until we know what tier we're in. So, uh, <laughs> oh, no. oh, oh, so oh my goodness it's been wonderful hasn't it nick yeah honestly i've always wanted to sort of have a a real sort of good chat and almost like sitting in the same room in a way but same with francois although we've we've all, all you know when we've gone out we've spoken about lots of things but it's been great and you know obviously with you mimi and <clears throat> um and uh yeah, I've really enjoyed it. It's been and it's been great. And I'm so glad, Francoise, that you were our first guest as well. And you've launched the Aww. you've launched our, our, our little um sojourn into the um I'm so glad I did. I'm so glad I did. <laughs> it's wonderful, it's very magical. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's been it's been wonderful talking to you. Aww. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity of um talking out, you know, sort of um, being myself, really, and 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 talk and, and saying what I needed to say. It's that, nice. That, Thank that, you. That, that, that's it's brilliant. Wonderful. And, and, it's wonderful. It's really you two, wonderful. And you two should talk about the publishing because obviously, Mimi, you've got some connections in that, and maybe you never know. Yes, never we can know. talk. Yeah. At, we can talk about. We can that talk. Then. We can we talk, can talk about, about, about all sorts of things. We can talk all, yeah, about all ex- sorts of things. Exactly. I'm sure. <laughs> isn't it okay. isn't it awful that we can't meet up and and talk about things now we have I know. to talk about it through a, a zoom meeting or a, oh. Oh. i'm hoping yeah, i'm hoping um that we will oh, be able to too. i hope so and we can make it i think we're still allowed i think we can meet in a park <laughs> yes yeah. i think we are i think we're <laughs> it's a drag. When Nick manages to get out of the armchair that he's not leaving. <laughs> no, no, when I manage to get up and do something. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to spending the next five years in this chair. It's going to be nice. You know? <laughs> oh, dear. Francois, I have to ask you, you're such really an effervescent lady. And, you know, you really have got this, I don't know, this joy for life for sure. What advice I would like to know? What advice would you give people out there that For are what? maybe losing hope? Um, oh, that's a difficult one. Um, just, just have faith in yourself. Mm. Mm. Um, and just, you know, um, oh, gosh. I can't... I, I can't advise people anything because it's it's unfair if I do. Um, people come to me afterwards and say, "Well, you told me that." that, that would, no, I don't want to do that. Um, I, 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 all I can say is, still have hope and still have faith in yourself. Mm. Um, and yeah. the more the more that you you have faith, the more that you know the more that you can succeed in things. Um, but it's up to you, really, to, to to sort of get up and go and do your own thing and believe in yourself. It's really up to you. Um, it's not up to anybody else around. It's just you. You're the only one that counts. You're the only that, one that matters. That is quite something, isn't it? It's well, having that courage. Yeah, you have to have courage you mm. have to you have you know, you can actually get down and, and you know for two a couple of days you 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 can sort of like go oh geez oh, i don't know what to do i don't know what um you know you, you can be down you can be downtrodden whatever but then afterwards you just you know there's something in you that's go 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 girl just get up and go and mm. do the things that you need to do and don't lose the hope don't lose faith just go and do it yeah that's good advice just, that's beautiful but it's not an advice really it's, it's 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 a um i don't know something that you know you should think about instead of something that you know um um 
I don't know. Like a positive mantra type thing rather than... Yeah, it is, it is, yeah. exactly. It it's is. words yeah. of wisdom, you know. Yes, yeah. it's words of, Exactly, exactly. Mm. Well, I don't know how wise I am, but... It's, mm. Well, I think very wise. I, I, you've been through so many things and hurdles in life that teaches one the wisdom of life. Yes, it teaches a lot of lessons. You know, mm. the older you get, the, the, the more of the lessons you... Um, it teaches you and you you just get on with it. You know, you really have got to get on with your life and don't moan, stop moaning and yes. stop, you know, being <laughs> um, being sort of like uh, 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 not an, only a moaner, but somebody that is always sort of uh, feeling sorry for yourself. The glass half empty there's nothing to feel. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, you stop it, you know, just 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 get on with it and, and do it. Go and do it. And that's the way you succeed is when you go and do it. Go, go, go get it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I love this thing. I don't know if you two have heard about this. Uh, it's called Say Yes More. And I think we yes. are so afraid sometimes to take a risk, to take a chance to change our life because you never know who you're going to meet like we've met today yeah, yeah. and you don't know what difference it's going to make in your life by just saying yes let's do it yes exactly yes yes <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if yes. what we just agreed to with nick but <laughs> hey you know <laughs> <laughs> yes, oh, yes dear. Nick. <laughs> so, so I'm gonna have to leave you guys. Yeah, okay. Thank you, yeah. Francoise. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been love. a pleasure. Thank you so love much. Thank you, you so um, much. And um, Francoise and Mimi have a lovely Christmas, both of you as well. And um and I'll keep And you too. You, you and both, you too, both of you, Mimi and you, Nick. Thanks, have a Francois. superb Christmas. Oh, you lots too. of love. Okay. Cheers, okay. 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 love. Bye bye. Bye bye, bye. bye. bye guys. Bye. 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 Thank you for listening to The Wanderlust Show, brought to you by your hosts, Nick Payne and Mimi Novik. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and see you in the next episode. For more information about Nick Payne and his work, take a look at his website at www.bobrummelproductions.co.uk And for more information about Mimi Novik's work, take a look at her website, www.miminovik.co.uk. Редактор